Last week, we um, began a message on the seven churches of Revelation. We are in a series called The Eleventh Hour and dealing with the teachings that happened in Revelation and looking at end times. It's interesting to me that as I listen to the radio and Christian radio, a lot of pastors are on this topic right now. That never completely surprises me because most pastors I know, if they're not doing a week-by-week thing or going through a Bible book series and they pray about what the calendar looks like, even in the year before, like in October, I go away, seek the Lord and say, Lord, where would you have us? What books would you have us go through so that in a course of 10 years, we've gone through the Old Testament and the New Testament? Well, here we are at Revelation. In October, the Lord laid that on my heart, not because of anything that was going on in the world, but that it was a season to be discussed and talked about. It doesn't surprise me that when this series takes place that the church at large is also talking about it because there seems to be a lot of signs and a lot of seasons. And everybody who wants to talk about Revelation really are looking for all those little nuggets of truth. Who's the Antichrist? What's the mark of the beast? Will we make it in the rapture? What are this? What's that? Who's the dragon? Who's Babylon? And they only want to get deep into it. They love that stuff. Ah, I do too. But I have tried in this series, and indeed we will be approaching the signs and the seasons and the sequence of Revelation. But in this series of eight messages, really only three of them deal with that. And two of them are the signs and the seasons. I'm only spending one, one week on the sequence. Oh, man, I really wanted to get deep in, into that third seal. You know, I'm sorry. Because Revelation is so much more than that. In fact, that's the minor piece for those who are in Christ. It's the major piece for those who are not in Christ. Because things are happening on earth, yes, but more things are happening in heaven. So when we read the book of Revelation, there's a blessing because we are invited into seeing Jesus in a light that we may not have known. Seeing His heart in His words to His churches. Seeing who He is on the seat of judgment and mercy. Witnessing the songs of heaven of those who are there. Today, I want to continue in this message about the seven churches. Last week we spoke about four different churches. And as we go through this sequence, if you'd turn with me to Revelations chapter 2, and we will actually be going into chapter 3 where we're going to begin, but I want to remind you that Jesus starts off every one of these letters to these churches that did exist in that time, but may also, and I believe they do also, represent a message to the church at large. And even it wasn't a universal thing, we can take note of how Jesus approaches churches and says, I like this and I don't like that. Do this and don't do that. And if He says it to one church, He says it to all churches. But He starts every letter with a representation of who He is. He names the church. He describes Himself. He says, I know your works, I know your hurts, and I know where you live. You're not going through anything that I don't see. You're not living anywhere that I don't, I don't know about. I know you, and I know what you're doing. He says that to everybody. He says it to you and me. I know you. I know what situation you're in. I know where you live. I know the pain you're going through. He declares to everybody in the church and those who are not functioning in the church and those who are sinning in the church and to those who are being true in the church, he says, listen, if you've got ears to hear, Would you please listen? Let you hear. And that's a message to you and I. If you have ears to listen to what he's saying, open your ears and hear. And then he he shares a commendation, something that's good about the church. And there are several churches that got none. And he shares a condemnation. He says, "I'm, I'm not happy with this. You need to stop this. Repent of it. Knock it off. He says it to all the churches but two. Two are not 
giving any condemnation. He offers a solution to them all of what they are to do, and then He tells them a reward for what their obedience is. Now, last week, we spoke on the church of Ephesus, which is the loveless church. They had left their first love. We talked about Smyrna, which was the oppressed church. The church in Pergamum, which is a corrupt church. And the church in Thyatira, which is the carnal church. Three of these four, he addresses very severely. And before I go into the last three churches, I just want to revisit the key message that he gives to these three churches that they have fallen into a pattern that they have bought into the ideology of their society. They have followed a prophetess named Jezebel that is saying that sexual debauchery is okay and can be married along with the truths of Christ. They followed the teachings of Balaam and the Nicolaitans who say that, look, You can do anything you want with hedonism. You can be drunk as much as you want. You can play as much as you want. You can do anything as long as you are affirming and caring and loving. And he says, you have faith, you have love, you're very welcoming. But look, man, you are inviting sin into your body, and I want you to knock it off. The church of America is falling down this trap of walking away from the authority of Jesus, and they only want to see a Jesus of a few of the Gospels and a few of the verses of the Gospel where He says, love. Love, 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 love. What they forget to see is before you love your neighbor and before you show self-love, you've got to love God with your mind. You've got to love God with your heart and your soul. You've got to love God with your body. And if you're not being obedient to God and showing Him love in this way, then you are going to be spinning off the rails when it comes to loving yourself or loving others. Oh, how compassionate we can be. And let me say, we should be friendly and compassionate and gentle and kind to everyone we meet. They should know we have love. But it is not loving to say that sin is okay in the church. It's not. It's not okay to say debauchery is okay and we can walk together as brothers and sisters in Christ when the Scripture is very clear. See, the church of today needs to read Revelations 2 and 3 and see the image of Jesus in chapter 1 as He stands as the judge who is righteous and holy and His judgments are true and right. So when He speaks to you and I, We're listening. Now, we're going to see Jesus as the Lamb. We looked at the Savior of Revelation, and He is the Lamb. But we see the Lamb of God slain, but we also saw the Lamb of God who was full of wrath and fury. That's not the Jesus the world wants to see. And it's not the Jesus that these churches were presenting. And He said to each one of them, knock it off. And if he gave a commendation, and he did to one of these churches, he was only to the ones who in that church who stood against those teachings. There are pastors in the pulpit right now preaching heresy and preaching debauchery and saying Christ is okay in it. I would just say, take a look at Revelations 1, 2, and 3 and tell me what you think when you actually know what Nicolaitans, Balaam, and Jezebel are all about. Now we look to the church of Sardis, which is in the modern town of Sardis, and it's actually Revelations 3 through 6. Unfortunately, this church is dead. It's a dead church. There are a whole lot of people who say that small churches are just dead churches. They aren't. 80% of all congregations on the planet are less than 85 people. 41% of all Christians attend churches of 50 or less. I heard one person say, and unfortunately it was a denominational leader who later recanted, and I'm grateful, he said, small churches are illegitimate and the pastors are inept. 
He was caught up in the megachurch mindset, and every church has to be 500 plus. Only 2% of all churches are 300 plus. So if that be the case, my friend, and God is the one who grows His church, then there must be something about a smaller church that He loves. Maybe it's the intimacy that takes place among the people in it. Maybe it's the involvement that has to take place for that church to actually function and each member can serve in their gifts. I don't know. But I know that this is, God is not illegitimate. God is not inept. And He would have to be inept if 80% of His churches were illegitimate and inept based upon size. So a dead church is not a small church, and a small church is not a dead church. You can have a church of 2,000 that's dead, and a church that 20 is dead, and it has nothing to do with numbers. As we look at this church and we understand that town, we have to take a look at a certain amount of things, because if you did a deep search into these cities and what they were known for in their day you'd have a greater understanding of what Jesus says them in the solution and what He calls them out for. The historian Herodotus recounts that the legend was found that Sardis was started by Heracles. It was the ancient capital of the Lydian Empire. In fact, it became one of the satrap provinces of the Persian Empire. It's been around for a long time. It sits on a high plateau, and they could see all around, and they were prideful in the fact they were on this plateau, but the funny thing is they'd been conquered 3,500 times. <laughs> they had a great gymnasium there, a massive theater there. They had the Temple of Artemis, and that portions of that are still visible to people today. They had a reputation in the entire area for centuries. Now look what Jesus says in verses 1 through 4 of chapter 3. I know your works. You have the reputation of of being alive, but you're dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember them, then what you have received and heard. Keep it. Repent. Repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Look at that. I will come, what? Against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who are not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. I'm often shocked when I read the letters to the churches And you'd think that he's writing to the church and say, well, well, the church is the saved people, right? No. It's the church that's existing, and there are good people, bad people, saved people, lost people within their midst. And he's writing to all of them. And for some reason, they've gotten a reputation that they were really a thriving work, but Jesus says, no, you're dead. And if you're dead, though you attend church, what reference is he pulling out here? I'm going to come like a thief in the night. That's very much the language he used in Matthew and in the Gospels about his rapture, his return, and those who would be taken and those who would be left. You're dead. Your garments are dirty. But some of you haven't soiled your garments. You see, a reputation in a sinful world means absolutely nothing. If the world is applauding you as a congregation for anything other than offering all those things that the Scriptures call for and that you're a biblically-based, uh, evangelistic, discipling type of a church, and of course the world would never commend you for that, it means nothing. What Jesus is saying is nominal Christianity means dead Christianity. They say that Christianity is the largest religion in the world, 3.2 billion people. 
And again, we've already talked about who sits in judgment, and it's not us. But we can understand what Jesus is saying is if you're dead, when I come, you're not going. If you're following the Nicolaitans, I'm going to snatch the church, the lampstand, out of your midst. You're not mine. He says here, when I come, I come against you. So 3.2 billion churches, and we have 340 million in our country. Our country is known to be a quote-unquote Christian country. If you ask somebody on the street that say they believe in God, they might even believe that Jesus is God. They might even say they believe Jesus is the Son of God because they were raised in America. Their grandpa and their parents went to Sunday school, so they'd heard about this. And Why not? I'm not an atheist, so I'll go ahead and buy into that. Well, guess what? The Bible says that demons believe this. The belief in it, the understanding of it, the acknowledgement of it has nothing to do with salvation. You can believe it all. A lot of people in America, they go to church, and I've had a, I have a brother who lived in Fort Worth for many years, and I was invited to come down there and maybe even start a church there, and I looked around and I said, I can't stomach this. Because church was a, a, a mantle they put on weekly, and it made no difference in how they lived out their life. They were social Christians. People who don't even attend church are not part of the body of Christ who live in America call themselves Christians. You can go all across Europe and then say, oh yeah, we're Christian. But nominal Christianity is dead Christianity. That scares me a little bit for a lot of individuals, and I am not the one who's going to say, I'm against you. Because Jesus is very inclusive, as I've mentioned before. Anyone who wants to come can come. My sacrifice is for the whole world. That's inclusion. But there's a moment when there is exclusion. You're with me or you're not. You're my children or you're not. This is a two-tiered city, and they had a higher class and they had a lower class. And the higher class lived up on the, on the, um, uh, on the plateau, and the lower class lived below. And, and when Cyrus came into Sardis, he looked up, and you could take a look. The lower class lived down here. You could take a look and see where he's coming, and they would have watchmen on the watch at all times to see if armies were coming. Hilarious that it had been conquered 3,500 times. Cyrus tells a story, and you can look back in history, that um, there was a watchman shoulder, a soldier who dropped his helmet, and they were looking for a place, how do I take this city? It's up, it's up there. And they saw a, a soldier on watch drop his helmet, and they watched how it filtered down and came down below. And lo and behold, this watchman came down, and there was a hidden staircase that went to the bottom, and they opened that up, got his helmet, and then went up, and so that's how Cyrus went up and conquered the entire city. Another area is they had thrown all of their refuse on one side of the city, and it stank so bad, and you could see the vultures flying around because no watchman wanted to stand on that side of the building. So you can see that the watchmen are not doing their jobs, they're not covering this wall, they're revealing gaps, they're lazy. Jesus uses this and he says, look, you think you're rich, you think you're up there, you think you're awake, but you're not awake, you're not strong. You've got weak points. So his solution is to wake up. Open your eyes to truth and reality, which Jesus is the truth. He says, be strong. Turn away from these things. Turn away from deadness. And what does he say that the reward will be? You get to walk with Jesus. He says your garments will not be soiled, and that's such a perfect image of the bride of Christ that we will be perfected. And our garments are white and pure. As opposed to these people, where many of them, their garments are dirty. They're not walking in Christ. They're not clothed in Christ. 
They've not put on Christ or the mind of Christ. They're nominal Christians. He's going to get into what happens when He returns. But He's warning us of what we're to look like and not look like, behave like and not behave like, who we love and what we don't love, how we handle these moments of trial versus temptation, seduction versus salvation, how we deal with the move of the Spirit versus the move of Satan in our lives. And he says, be clothed with righteousness because that's my bride. Let us not be dead. In this congregation, there may be many who are faithful and their garments are white. Just check your heart and make sure you're not a nominal believer, that you are in love with Jesus, that you're abiding in Jesus, that He is your Savior, He is your bridegroom, and the Spirit is moving in you and you are led by the Spirit. We come to the church in Philadelphia, it's known as the faithful church. If there's a church I'd want to be like, it probably looks like this. It was known as the gateway to the east, and it had massive vineyards and textiles and leather goods. It's really, if you go there, and I watched a lot of videos on this, and one person said, it's the second least impressive ruins after Thyatira. There's not a lot to see there. The remains of the church of St. John are built about 600 A.D., and there's an arch there that looks like an open door. The whole site of this entire city was about an acre. It was not large, but it was at a juncture of two roads. It had a, an earthquake at the end of the first century that destroyed the city, and so in, in, rather than do anything, they built massive vineyards, and they were so proud of it that Domitian came in and he burned all of these vineyards. So let's see what Jesus says. He is. He says, I'm the Holy One who opens and shuts doors. I know your works. I've set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not but lie. Behold, I'll make them come, and they'll bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you, because you've kept my word about patience, endurance. I'll keep you from the hour of trial that's coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I'm coming soon, so hold fast what you have, so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. He says to these people, look, you're little, but you're loved. You're not huge. You don't have a lot of influence, but you're being faithful, patient. You have endurance. You didn't deny my name. There's no condemnation here. See, they had stood fast against the teachings that were false. Did they see growth? They did not see growth. It's fascinating to me that the only thing that's remaining in this town is an open door, about half of an arch in the last parts of it, and pillars. <laughs> that's all that remains after 2,000 years, the door and the pillars. And Jesus says, I am the open door. You'll be known as an open door. No one's going to shut your door. What a beautiful thing. His reward is that I'm going to give you open doors. Where you go, you'll be blessed. I'm going to make you a pillar. You'll be named with God. How powerful is that? He mentions individuals in this church that are still caught up in Judaism and they might be playing this game of the temple of Satan, which is Zeus and Artemis, and all these things that are infiltrating the church. 
They're standing against it. And they will be named of God. Now, the last church I want to bring up today, and I sure hope that as I walk with the Lord, I want to be an open door to people and knowing that when they come to Christ, He'll make them a pillar if we stand with Him and He's going to seal His name, His Father's name on us. The church of Laodicea is probably the most preached on church in existence because it's called the lukewarm church. Now, we've had a loveless church, an oppressed church, a corrupt church, a carnal church, a dead church and a faithful church, but now we've got one that's lukewarm. This city is the ancient capital of Phrygia. It was renowned in the entire Asia Minor for a place of banking and gold coinage. It was also known because it had a medical school and a massive textile industry with very costly fabrics. There's a place there that you can't go into. It's a church, and they will not allow you to go into. And many speculations say that when armies would come and then see the armies coming, they would bury their gold. And there was a 25-year, even today, prison sentence if you take a rock from this site. That's how important gold was to this place. They had a dye that would dye things black and they had a medical school that created an eye salve and an inner salve, renowned in the area. So they felt they were rich. But what does Jesus say? It's interesting that there, this entire area is, 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 is got a dual location, a, thi- a Laodicea and a city called Hierapolis, and just around the way there was a, 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 a water that you can drink, and it's like carbonated water there, the best water. But it goes through and filters down through the valley, and it hits Laodicea, and in the limestone there, whatever product is there, it becomes nasty. In fact, there at Hierapolis, there's a tunnel called the Gateway to Hades, and people would go in, and if they came out, they would be called gods because there were gases in there that would kill you. So people would go in there in the olden days, and they'd crawl on their knees so they would not be affected by the gases, and when they came out, they said, how in the world did they leave? It was called the Gate of Hades. But the pipe system that they worked, the stream system that would go into these gaseous things, and when it hit Laodicea, the water was nasty. It was tepid. Interesting that Jesus speaks in these words when He says He's the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. And He says this in verses 15 through 19, I know your works. You're neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'll spit you out of my mouth. You say I'm rich, I have prospered and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched and pitiable, poor, blinded, and naked. Look at that. You're poor, though they printed and were the banking center. They were naked, though they were known for their textiles and the black dye and very renowned for their clothing. They're blind, though they're the place that produces the salve for eyesight. Everything they were renowned for and arrogant about and held dear, Jesus says, that's nothing. You're the opposite of that. Verse 18 says, I counsel you. Buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. Salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see those whom I love, I reprove and I discipline. 
So be zealous and repent. He gives no commendation here. There's no good word for you. Rather be hot or cold, at least you'd know where you stand, but you don't even know where you stand. You've placed your entire reputation and and, uh, identity on these things, and it's the opposite of those things. But I can offer you those things. What's the condemnation that he offers to them? How would you like to have Jesus say, you make me sick? I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. I I can't even, I, I can't even. Why would he do that? Because we're holding on to certain things that we identify as our strengths. And we're leaning into those strengths and propping those strengths up. And he says, no. There's no place for that. I offer you refined gold. I offer you the garments you're going to be clothed in. I offer you the salve for your eyes. So he says, be pure. By his treasure. He says, see the truth, anoint your eyes, and then you'll see the truth. He says, hear me, open up to me. And what's his reward? says here, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come to him and eat with him, and he will be with me. And the one who conquers, I'll grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He says, abide with me, dine with me, sit with me, be with me, 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 me. So, what's the message to you and I. So what, Dave? Well, as we go through these churches, He has given us instructions. And in your notes, they're there, and on the screen, they're there. This is the message, not just to these churches in the first and second century, but to the church throughout all ages, and to you and I as a congregation, and to you individually as well. Where are we with Jesus? And he says, remember from where you are fallen, wake up. He says over and over, repent, go the correct direction, knock off your sin, turn away from deadness, turn away from lukewarmness. He says, return to your first love. Seek the holy things, not the earthly temporal things. He says, repeat the works that you did at first. You remember the zeal you had when you were on fire for me? Come back to that. The work and the energy that you just loved serving me. Come back to that. He says, be rooted. Be rooted in and hold fast to the truth of God's Word. Friends, it's critical that we as a people of God hold true to this. And not black out certain things and tear certain pages out and say that must be figurative. Oh, that must be illustrative. That can't be enough for today. That's only irrelevant back then. These words you cannot just walk away from. Be rooted and hold fast to them. He says reject false teachings. Reject affirming immorality. Is this not the message for the church today? He says, restore your faith, because a little lived out faithfully is a lot to him. Live it out. And reject fear of what you are and what you may suffer. More Christians have been killed in the last 50 years than in all of history combined. In the last 20 years, there's been genocide of Christians throughout Africa, Indonesia, Asia, and other places in this world. Maybe you recall in the battle of Syria when they put these Christians to death and they carved an N into their foreheads before they massacred them because they would not renounce the Nazarene. Now, we're afraid of being censored. Maybe someone will cancel me on my Facebook page. Maybe you might lose your job. There may be someone who will say, you cannot teach in this school if you hold to these truths. 
You can't work for my company if you stand for this thing and not affirm these things. We're moving into the day when we will suffer, we'll be canceled, we'll certainly be criticized, we'll be shunned by family members who won't come to holidays nor invite you to any holiday because of your position that Jesus has said for you to reject. It's sad. It'll tear up families. It'll break up homes. It'll separate churches. But we have got to be rooted and reject these things and restore our faith and live right for Him and reject fear, but live in faith because He is coming soon. I'm going to ask you to pray with me. Next week I'll be looking at the seat of Revelation. But we spent a couple of weeks in trying to be a student and looking at the Savior and now these churches. Go back and look through the message of these seven churches this week if you wouldn't mind. Google the teachings of what the Laodiceans and the Balaam and Jezebel were and what was meaning going on there. And you will have an illumination about what Jesus is telling us as the body of Christ to be and who we're not to be. In all things we show love and gentleness and kindness. And I will work hard to walk beside anybody for their well-being. But they will always know that I stand by the Scripture. It won't change my love, but I will never, never abide by the false teachings. And I do not want to be spit out of His mouth. I don't want the lampstand taken away. I don't want Him to come like a thief and I'm left behind. When He's knocking, I want my door open to Him at all times. Pray with me. Father, I am convinced that the world and the church has been locked in to a handful of statements that you made, Jesus. I'm convinced that they have locked into a particular image of you, Jesus. And there is nothing wrong with the image of a loving Savior. In fact, we're grateful. There's nothing wrong with the sacrificed Savior on the cross, the Lamb of God. In fact, we hold that dear to our heart that those who would may come Many have talked about in the last weeks the picture of the resurrected Savior that those who are in Him or with Him have life. And yet, Father, I'm convinced that the church has walked away from the image of the Jesus of Revelation. Nor have they thought through the actual words of Jesus. They say, Jesus never talked about this. Jesus never mentioned this. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, you did. May we be looking at the Jesus of Revelation 1 throughout 22. And let me, Father, live my life in a way that is obedient to the words you spoke to the people who claim they are yours. Let my life be measured by the scales of Revelation's two and three, as to what you approve and what you abhor. And help me not to be swayed. For these people, Lord God, if someone has not come to you, if they are nominal, if they're fringe, if they're not walking with you, they don't understand that life that you give and their door and their heart's not open to you, and they're holding on to things that they treasure and they have these as their identity, let them give them over to you because they are nothing, but you offer them everything. We give ourselves completely to you. Heart, soul, mind, body, every breath, every step, every deed, every word, every thought, Lord God. May we be in your ambassadors. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Well, may those words be guiding posts in your life as we move away from the churches and go towards the seat of revelation, looking at the throne, the seat of mercy, the seat of judgment, the seat of glory, the seat of holiness. We'll look at that next week. Hey, next week, uh, um, is it next week is Mother's Day? Is that what's going on? Well, then I, is that right? I think it is. So I think it's two weeks from now we're going to be going into that particular message. That's okay. I uh, hope you're here next week. We're going to celebrate the ladies of the church, and, and we'll have a, a, a beautiful time together. Would you stand with me? Uh, if, if You know, once a month we have a prayer breakfast, and that happened yesterday. It was a beautiful time of study of the Word of God and praying and eating and just being together. This coming Saturday, however, there's a brunch going on. And, and that's right, right, Linda? And so it's in your bulletin. It's a ladies' brunch. Things are going to happen there. If you haven't gone to those, you're missing out on some awesome time. And Linda, wave your hand. Uh, if you want to be engaged in, in, in that next week, or also the ladies' Zoom Bible study meeting and fellowship that takes place on Monday nights, then make sure you uh, go and give her a hug because she's a very loving, caring person. All right, my friends, as we go out there, uh, as the Lord leads you in a generous way, uh, if you uh, uh, desire, there's a place to give. Online, there's a way to do that. It goes strictly to the works of the gospel and the ministries here. And as you go out these doors, as I say every week, you're Christ's ambassadors. Be good ones.